Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Coffee with Kleppe on this fine November day here. I'm coming from my office in Missouri, and I've got my partner and colleague, uh, Cody Mack. He's up in uh, Milwaukee. Hopefully, it's a nice day up there, too, is going to uh, be uh, presenting with me today. Um, Cody's been out in the field for a number of years, and he's also our tech support person up there. He does a lot of the... Um, Oh, product development and stuff like that. So he's a good person to have, have on here today with questions as far as application. He knows uh, the calls that come in and how we can help you. So Hydronics, hopefully everybody is getting the Hydronics mailed to them. If not, certainly go to our website and sign up. There's the uh, link at the bottom and, um, and we'll mail these to you. Twice a year they come out on different topics and we can also make the past issues available to you if you want to keep all the hard copies in a binder. They are on our website as a PDF also, so if you need a picture out of one of those or you need a diagram to send to somebody or something like that, you're welcome to, uh, to go to our website and pull off the, uh, the file and use that information. We also ask you to uh, keep sending us ideas for topics. You know, we're always trying to keep ahead of the game here, a couple, couple issues as far as having things keyed up, what we want to talk about next. So if there's something that you see out there that we could help you or the industry with, uh, you know, send it to us and we'll, we'll see if we can crunch something together for it. Now today's topic, um, actually we've covered this um, a couple different times. We've covered it in uh, hydronics number 15, 14, and 16 there as far as um, zone valves and circulation and controlling systems. And we've also done some uh, webinars on it in the past too. So um, I'm not gonna get a real heavy into pumping specifically the different types of pump, delta T, delta P, constant pressure and this and that because we did cover that in a two part actually, John Sigenthaler. Uh, did that for us, uh, analyzing uh, pump head and also uh, analyzing circulator performance was a two-part series on that. So if you do have pump-specific questions and applications, uh, I'd ask you to review those and also um, page through Hydronic 16 again for that information. The um, webinars will all be archived on our uh, YouTube station there. It takes a couple days. Katie uh, puts those together, changes the format, and gets them put up there. And uh, so keep an eye out for that. That. And, uh, of course, a lot of the back ones that have been very popular, you can see when you log on to them how many views that we've been getting on some of those that are in the archives. So that's a, it's a good tool to have at your disposal to, uh, to review some of the past webinars and topics that we've talked about in a nice, uh, nice picture there also. And then next month, a friend of mine, a friend of the industry, Paul Roars, he's got an S at the end of his name, similar, but we're not related, is going to join us. He's with Lockenbauer, been with Lockenbauer a number of years. He also does tech support and a lot of their training. And we wanted to have him come and talk a little bit about the, the choices for domestic hot water um, production, whether it's a tank, tankless, or combi water heaters. There's a lot of choices out there right now. We think Paul's a, a good person to, uh, both from a practical experience as well as working for a manufacturer to give us a, a little bit of insight on uh, how to select the different types of product and how to apply them. So uh, make sure you have that one keyed up for next month. Coffee Excellence Contest, we're going to vote on the uh, winners uh, from last month at the end of the uh, presentation today, but it is going to roll until November 30th, so you've got a little bit of time left to get your entries in, and then uh, December we will pick uh, the grand prize winner for a trip, and you can see there on the right, that's the, uh, one of the trips of some of the people we took over from a, a past uh, winner that went over to Italy with us, and uh, we had a great time and uh, great food there, so get uh, get your entries in and make sure you show up in December so we can uh, we can vote on the grand prize winner. All right, so today's topics. Now, really, this is the teaser questions that went out when we advertised the webinars that are coming up. I'm not going to read through all of them, but really what we're going to talk about today is, uh, oh, some of the reasons that you would choose maybe one over the other or, you know, when do I absolutely have to use a zone pump and, and uh, when is a zone valve a better option for it. So really, we're just going to give you information at the end of it. The spoiler alert here, we're not going to tell you one's better than the other, one you can use one and not the other. I mean, there's always uh, choices, but we think... Uh, what we've got here today can kind of give you a little bit of insight, especially with the newer pumps and some of the newer technology that's out there. We thought this would be a good topic to combine zone valves and pumps to just put it all out there, put it in slides and say, okay, here's what you would get with this application. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of math and a little bit of uh, tech in here, but there's also some pictures. So I think we've, uh, we've got a winner here today. So let us know how we do with this. 
Now, one of the things that I'm, I'm learning more about as I go through the years here and I spend more time around with engineers is that it really pays to do a little bit of the work ahead of time before you show up on the job with a truck full of pipe and parts and stuff like that. And it's become very easy to do this. We've got simulation programs out there that you can crunch some numbers and decide what sort of uh, pump or what type of zoning you're going to use on it. Uh, there's different choices. I like to use this little program here that John Siegenthaler developed years ago called the uh, uh, hydronic design uh, simulator and basically what you do you can kind of see in the picture right? that's probably pretty small there but you just define the whole system on this little uh, program here you can put this um, common piping you can define what that is you can choose how many elbows or valves or circuit setters are in there and then down here you can just pick up here how many different zones and then you can define the zones if it's spin tube it could be a radiant circuit it could be an air handler you can define all those um, and of course the heat output that you need from those. And then also you can toggle them on and off up here on these little buttons. So if you want to run them all, and what you'll see as you start toggling these on and off, you'll see how that changes what's happening with this, uh, the energy that the pump is uh, putting into the circuit there. So it allows you to select the correct pump and, and you know, error signs will come up. If you grossly oversize the pump or something like that, you'll get a, a little uh, caution symbol or something like that comes up and says, you know, bad application for that pump. But this really helps you select the right pump and components when you go out there. Now, I know that a lot of the pumps now are, you know, multiple speed and that we've got variable speed pumps. So you've got a little bit more flexibility that you don't get the exact right pump. But you want to at least have a good idea what that pump's going to do to that circuit when you put it in there as far as the amount of pressure it's going to add to the system and the, certainly the flow rate so you don't get out there and find yourself uh, undersized. And one of the places that I'll caution you about that is with some of these new high efficiency ModCon boilers, some of those with the small tube heat exchanger, it takes a lot of pump to just circulate through the heat exchanger on those tube type of uh, boilers. So, you know, you might have a high head pump required just to circulate through your boiler, through your primary, secondary hydraulic separator. But on the distribution side, you might be able to get away with a couple small pumps on speed one even. So that's why it pays to put all that in here and crunch the numbers and know before you go that you've uh, selected the right pumps for the job. Over pumping gets you in trouble, under pumping gets you in trouble. So you want to be right in the sweet spot when you do that. So we're going to start with valves, and I'm going to show you uh, three of the choices that we have uh, that we can offer you from Calefi. So on the left there is what's called a thermoelectric valve. So basically there's a little heat motor in here, and as you apply power to that, that little cartridge gets warm in there, and it opens this valve here. It's kind of a, uh, oh, I guess we'd call it a plunger-style valve in there. It just raises and lowers a little flat disc onto a seat in here. What's nice about this type of valve is it's, it's completely quiet. You won't hear any motor, you won't hear any springs, you won't hear any gears or anything like that. That's typically the actuator that you'll see on radiant manifolds because obviously sometimes those might be in a bedroom wall or closet wall or something like that and you don't want to hear any sound at all. So that's the beauty of a thermal uh, type of actuator in my opinion. Um, this valve here has about a four CV. Now the CV numbers uh, refers to how many gallons per minute you can flow through that valve with a one pressure drop. So if we had a pressure gauge on both sides of this valve and we flow uh, four gallons a minute through that, we'd have a one PSA drop. So not a super high flow valve, but certainly enough for uh, you know small fin tube zones or uh, obviously manifold actuators where you've got different uh, loops on your manifold and you could put an actuator like that. A choice of different actuators that we offer, that's our what we call our twist top there. Uh, nice about that, you can manually lock it open um, so you can get flow going through and make your end switch for troubleshooting and stuff. Probably the go-to zone valve, I would say, in the industry is this type of valve here. This is a motorized spring return valve. So you apply power to this valve. The motor in there spins that valve open. I think of this as a flapper type of valve. There's actually a little flat uh, EPDM, peroxide cured EPDM in the cluffy valve that just uh, motors open and then the spring closes it back against the seat in the other end of it. A lot of choices in um, sizes and voltages and stuff on that. We're going to talk more about that individually here in a minute. Then over here, and that is available, uh, let's say I think it's available in five different CV uh, ranges. I'll show you those here in a picture next of the difference between the CV ratings on that. And then over here on the right, our 644 series. This is basically a motorized ball valve. So just think of a ball valve when you look at the end of it that we put a motor on. The beauty of that is it's a full port valve, so very high flow. I think that's what, a 13 CV, Cody, on that valve? So we got great flow. Uh, I think it's 11, if I remember correctly. But yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's up there for sure. Yeah, so high flow, I think. See, that's why Cody's here today, folks. So we've got a high flow through that, but also a high shutoff pressure. 
and this will get used a lot of time on geo pump and dumps where you're trying to close off against the well pump pressure. You might have 50, 60 pounds of pressure. So uh, high flow, high shutoff pressure. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I want to point out, and let's see, maybe let me go to the next picture first and see if I got the picture better. Yeah, so the connections on this, I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this. So all these valves now are available with a thread that you can choose different tail pieces for that. So, and you can actually mix and match them. I've got a better slide, I think, coming up on that. So there's the choice of the valve. There's kind of the differences in the performance of them. Um, also on the Z1 zone valve, the center valve that I just showed you, our spring return valve, it's available with a normally open and a normally closed uh, function to it. So basically what a normally closed valve is, is when there's no power being applied to that valve, let's say you've got a 24 volt valve, there's a call for heat from the thermostat, goes through the relay board, opens that valve, flow goes through it, it makes the end switch, starts up the pump um, if you require an end switch on it. A normally open valve is open all the time and you, when you apply power, it closes that valve. Now where that valve can be, um, handy where it gets applied a lot is on like a um, oh maybe a dormitory or something like that and the reason they would do that is that if there's a power outage the valve is going to go open so they can get some gravity flow through that and it might prevent a building from freezing up or keep the room to a certain temperature even though the power is out and that now obviously you might not have a pump running but it might be enough to keep uh, you know the building from uh, freezing up or something like that so I don't see a lot of those normally open valves uh, being applied in residential applications but I'm going to ask Cody to step in here a little bit and tell me a little bit about uh, some of the, the things to be aware of when you use a normally open valve so uh, tell us some more about this Cody. Yeah so I mean we, we do get calls about the normally open valves uh, pretty regularly like you mentioned a lot of commercial applications are using normally open uh, actuators and valves um, there are thermostats out there that are kind of kind of reverse you know reverse operation type thermostats that can be used with normally open valves like you said a lot of times it's being used where they they want it to fail open and overheat as opposed to fail closed and, and cause freezing or damage to a property uh, from there though uh, just like it says at the bottom of your slide uh, they cannot be powered closed for extended period of the time uh, you know, it, it basically it does cause some issues with the lubrication inside there, but not only that, to power them closed for say three or four months out of the summer, uh, you're just wasting energy, you know, and, and so you need to cycle those valves every now and then or have some type of a, a design within your controls to, to allow those to unpower during summer months, maybe, you know, maybe with warm weather shutdown or something like that. Yeah, that's a good point to exercise them basically. So think of this as a building maybe in a mild climate, say, I don't know, pick Northern California where there might only be a couple months of the year when there's a heat load, you know, on the building where you're required to open that valve. So the rest of the year, there's power on that valve keeping it, um, you know, energized. And so the valve, you know, that little motor in there, that five watt motor is basically a heater when it's uh, to the end position. So you've got that heat being generated in there. And of course, that's... Uh, uh, that's what we're concerned about is just having that power on that valve 24-7 for you know, months at a time. So just be aware of that. <clears throat> All right, so here's a little bit about the pipe connections that I just mentioned. So what we've been doing on our valves is putting this uh, external thread, and that's called a G-thread. I think it stands for gas thread. It's a common thread in Europe, but it's also common wherever you use a gasket or a, um, a washer connection to the valve. So that's not a, a pipe thread that you can't just thread a coupling or a, a male, female adapter on there. You have to uh, have to put a gasket or a fiber washer in between there. But when we make a body like this, now look what it does. It gives us all these different uh, choices for um, connection tail pieces. So in this picture I'm showing, there's a, uh, a male thread, three-quarter male thread. There's a two-quarter press, one-inch press. I think that's a three-quarter sweat there. So think about this. If I know a lot of the uh, contractors back east are still using like speedy hat Headers, which is a welded steel header that gives you a threaded connection to come off their boiler. So this valve, you could screw right into the speedy header, and then on the other side, you could go to copper, you could go uh, sweat, or you could go to PEX. Some of the jobs that we see sent into us, uh, job photos, uh, they're coming in right off the zone valve with PEX, and that's going to remote, maybe a radiant manifold or an air handler or something like that. So we um, give you that option that you can mix and match all these different connection sizes. So. That same connection is on the other two valves that I just showed you a couple slides up on our thermoelectric valve as well as our um, 644 ball valve series has that same thread. So all these fittings that I'm showing you in this picture 
uh, can be used for all three of the different zone valves. Now also over here, we have, this is kind of clever, we've got a little gauge um, adapter that goes on that thread also on that one inch G thread. So let's say you're using this three-way valve as a mixing valve or something like that, and you want to know what the temperature is coming out of it, you can put that adapter on the, one of those ports and then, or temperature coming into it, whatever the case might be, and now you've got a little bit of an indication to uh, adjust or balance or something like that. So. I believe this tailpiece, Cody, is also made in the press connection fitting on the bottom now. This is a sweat version, but I think that's pressed too. Yep, yep. Uh, available with that uh, one inch G thread on the end of it to where you could use our press tailpieces. You could use, you know, whatever the pecs or whatever you wanted to right off there as well. You're correct. Yep. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I don't know of anybody else in the industry that really has that much of a selection of fittings. And, and it's also nice for the wholesalers because now there's one skew on their shelf. They carry this body, and then you go in and say, "Okay, I want a you know a Z1 zone valve, and I want a press by sweat or press by um, thread or whatever it might be." So it allows you to mix and match. They keep just the different bodies on the shelf, and then packages of two or three of these um, different tail pieces that you can take. So. All right, the CV number, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So here's an example, I just put these on my workbench and took a picture of them. And here's three of our different Z1 uh, bodies, four of the different bodies. So notice the difference in these bodies. In fact, I think some of these are all three quarter. It looks like an inverted flare there, a threaded type there, a sweat there, another sweat here. And notice the difference in these valves, and we offer one, 2.5, 3.5, 5, and 7 um, CV rating on these valves. So this over here would be an example of a 1 CV, and you can see the change there is the size of the, the, the port in there, the size of the hole in it. And the reason for that is this valve right here, this 1 CV valve, will shut off against 75 pounds of pressure uh, delta P, or pressure differential. This valve over here happens to be, I think, an inch and a quarter valve there, 7.5, uh, has a 20-pound shutoff. So if you have a job, this valve typically would go in a, uh, maybe a coil package from an OEM, uh, like a first company or Magic Air that sends out coil packages, um, hookup kits for their um, you know, air handlers or coils like that. They'll put a, a valve like this in either a, a 1 or a 2.5 not knowing exactly what kind of pump's going to be applied to that system that might have a high pressure that they have to shut off. If they have a big higher flow valve here, they might not be able to shut off against that pressure. So that's really the application of that. What I would caution the, the repair guys about, if you go out on a job to replace the zone valve and you're on a commercial building, just be aware of that CV number. If you put this valve on that application where they've got a high pressure pump down in the basement, you're going to get bleed through on that valve. And you say, well, I've got a bad zone valve. It's not shutting off tight. Well, it might be misapplied. So that number is important, especially when you start um, looking at jobs that have, uh, you know, high pressure circulators in the building somewhere. <clears throat> so that's, in a nutshell, the difference. Notice, too, that um, this inch and a quarter valve is a 7.5 CV valve. Now, if you look at the numbers on that, I mean, we can put 19 gallons a minute through a one-inch copper pipe uh, with a four feet per uh, second velocity on it, but um, this valve at that kind of flow rate, you're going to have about, uh, let's see, I ran some calcs on this before we started, <clears throat> you're going to have about a 4.83 uh, 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 PSI that you have to shut off against that, uh, that delta P on that valve with that kind of flow rate going through it. So just, uh, I mean, we did that to make it nice so you can have a large diameter pipe going in that without a bunch of adapters, but going to a larger diameter connection size doesn't give you a higher flow rate for that valve. That's still a 7.5 CV valve, even though you could put a, a pipe on that that could flow 19 gallons a minute. So what you want to do in that case is use, there's charts online, we've got a little Excel cheat sheet that we can mail to you that you can put the CV of the valve and the gallons per minute that go through that valve and it will tell you you know what kind of flow you're going to have going through that so yeah, and bob this is a, a oh sorry bob i was just going to say that this is a topic that comes up pretty regularly you know uh in each of our sizes of valves and different connection types we offer multiple cv values and and you're 100 percent correct that you want to make sure that that you're choosing the right one. Uh, the other thing that comes up real regularly is, is people think that when we list our zone valves in our catalog um, based on their max differential pressure, they think that's the maximum pressure they can have in the system as far as like a static pressure. Uh -huh. and, and while while our zone valves are, I think they're rated for 300 PSI, you know, static or working pressure, um, it's, it's the differential pressure across that valve uh, you know, from inlet to outlet that we're really worried about because 
if you do happen to exceed that maximum differential pressure, which, like you said, is quite difficult to do in a residential application, but in, in commercial applications, it's definitely possible. If you exceed that, then what's going to happen is that force, that differential is going to start forcing that paddle open, and, yep. and then you're going to get overheating zones. Um, you're, you know, it, it's just going to lead to all kinds of trouble. So make sure that you're choosing the right, right ones for sure. And call us if you need help with that. I mean, Cody and Greg and any of us really can help you make sure you got the right selection. And maybe I should have cleared that up a little bit on the front end. This symbol right here, Delta, happens to be, what, the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet, I think, something like that. It really refers to difference or change. So when you see a Delta in front of a P, that means pressure differential. So that's the pressure differential so that that valve is closing off against. You'll see this little Delta um, sometimes in front of the letter T for temperature differential. So that would be you know, temperature differential through a boiler, through a heat exchanger, uh, maybe a pump that works on a, a delta um, T type of uh, application. So that's just to clear up that delta so you know what we're talking about here. Now here's the valve that came back to us, that returned back to us, and they said the valve wasn't shutting off tight. We were getting leakage through it. Well, you know, this is a case of water quality. One of my favorite topics these days when I go out on the road training is, you know, pay attention to this water quality because you can see what's happened. So there's the flapper that has to close off against what once was a nice, shiny, clean brass seat. And you can see this buildup in here that's preventing that flapper from actually getting to the brass seat and the valve's leaking through. Now, I maybe that was an open system that had a lot of fresh oxygenated or water with a lot of minerals constantly being added to the system. But um, you know, that's not a valve defect, obviously. You can see the little return tag on it here. That's a condition that was caused by the application. Uh, but the nice thing about this valve, being a cleffy, you can see that the bottom can be removed from this valve on all of our Z1 valves, and you can get in there and you could actually replace that, um, this whole, whole assembly here if for some reason there's a nick or a gouge in it, but you could certainly open that with your fingers and get in there with maybe some uh, scratch cloth or something like that and clean that off and, and put that valve back in the service. That valve probably could have been salvaged right at the job site, installed in the building, had they known that uh, you know they had the ability to get in and do that. I know a lot of people would rather just get a new valve sent to them, but uh, that's why we do that, is we make that so you can get in there and uh, troubleshoot or service the valve on the job. And also notice on, I uh, you can't quite see it on the tags, I think all of our zone valves, the Z1, do have that CV number on the tag on one side or the other. So if you have one that's been, uh, you know, the box is missing or something like that and say, well, what valve do I have? Well, number one, you can look in the end like the picture I just showed you and see the, the port size going through it, but it should have a, uh, a sticker on it telling you the CV of that valve. On the opposite side of that valve body too, Bob, there's actually um, there's actually going to be a stamp model number. So it'll be a Z2 dot, dot, uh -huh. dot, you know, whatever. Um, I guess another good thing to mention on, on this slide, since you're still here, Bob, is, is two things actually. Um, we do offer repair kits for our, our zone valves as well, where they include the new a new paddle for whatever reason. If, if you're, I mean, those are a peroxide cured EPDM paddle and they're gonna be very resistant to a lot of torturous elements or you know, applications. But if for whatever reason you do need to replace it, you can get a rep repair kit with that, uh, that new paddle along with a new uh, C-clip as well as a new O-ring for the bottom cap. And, and another great thing to mention on this slide too is, you know, for open open systems, we do actually manufacture uh, a handful of lead-free or low-lead uh, zone valve bodies that will meet the low-lead requirements for domestic hot water applications. Now, the, they're typically not used for, you know, a shutoff type valve. You know, we talked about the maximum differential pressures before, but if you're using domestic hot water to flow through fan coils or, you know, whatever the case may be, or through baseboard, you can you can use some of our zone valves for it as well, but just make sure that they are the lead-free models. Yeah, the, and there's I know there's a lot of those combis, and I shouldn't say a lot, but there are combi systems still being installed out there where they're using the same you know hot water, domestic hot water to go through a uh, you know an air handle like the old Apollo systems. Are, in fact, I say old, they're still available, so we do see valves being um, used as in combi systems, and that's what I suspect here when I see that kind of mineral buildup. Also on this, uh, like Cody said, this is removable with a little clip on the top, and it does have a double O-ring seal on the shaft too, so it's got a little bit more um, technology to it than some of the others. We might be the only valve out there that this uh, EPDM paddle that we use is actually peroxide cure. And when you peroxide cure a, a product, a rubber, a PEX, or something like that, it cross-links it. And that's what a lot of the tubing, that, you know, like say a new tubing is cross-linked, and that makes it a lot more 
um, oh, I guess it's stronger, better from when you have high chlorinated water and stuff like that. So that's uh, one of the few valves out there that I think that has a peroxide cured paddle. So if you do have a chlorinated water condition going through it, um, it won't turn into a gummy rubber like your toilet flappers do when you put chlorine tablets in there. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about circulators. So, you know, whatever system you have out there, if you're going to have zone valves, somewhere in the system you're still going to need a circulator pump. Something's going to, you know, make the flow go through the pipes through the building. So it's not a matter of if you can just use zone valves, you're still going to have a circulator. So if you're going to use a circulator and you're going to have zone valves, uh, multiple zone valves on it, Really what you'd like to do is pick a circulator that has a flat, a flat pump curve. Now a perfectly flat curve like we're showing in Nick's example is, it just isn't possible. You can't make a centrifugal pump with a flat curve like that, but um, some of the pumps have um, a fairly flat curve. Some of the old BNG 100s was an excellent pump for a curve that looks a little bit like this green one here. So in this example here, suppose you had a job, and we know the numbers here, and let's say you required 12 gallons a minute, and this was 12 gallons a minute there, and you ran up. Both of these pumps would actually uh, work for that job, 12 gallons a minute at that operating point. So you say, well, should I use this pump here? Let's call that maybe a high head. I don't know. Let's throw out a number like a 2699, or should I use this pump here, which is maybe a 1558? Well, if you're going to be zoning, you want this flat curve. So as the zone valve shut off, you're not changing that differential pressure by a lot as you would on a high head pump, if that makes sense. So when all the zone valves are open and you're out here at the operating point, you're getting 12 gallons a minute divided amongst the, all the zones that are open. Um, you got, you're just right at your design condition, but as the valves start shutting off, you're going to start running up that pump curve. And if you had this high head, this red curve here, as you start running up there, now what you're going to notice is a velocity increase. You're going to start to hear noise in those zones that are still on because now you're increasing the flow going through there, the rate of flow going through there, and you'll get noise and obviously uh, can get wear and stuff like that. So the flat curve pump is the one you want to choose. Now, there's a couple other things you can do when you choose to... Um, zone with valves that I'll show you that can uh, help you with a system like that. And one is a device called a differential, uh, differential pressure bypass valve. Some uh, You might see it called a PAV, pressure activated valve, or PAB, pressure activated bypass valve. But basically what this is, is like a spring and a flapper in here, um, a plunger, kind of almost like a pressure relief valve. So when this pump, this is a fixed speed circulator, and let's say we chose that to give us, well, let's go out here, what do we got? With all the zones open, maybe we've got uh, 12, 11 GPM going through that. So on a design day, we need to move 11 gallons a minute through this entire system. Maybe we've got 110,000 BTU boiler. So we're gonna size that circulator to handle this job under design condition when all the valves are open. Now as the valves start closing off, this pump is still giving you a fixed output. So what this valve here, the bypass valve allows you to, um, to happen here, is that excessive head energy that's being added to that that you can't use out in the zones that are closing off, now just goes right back to the boiler. So I kind of liken it to slip in the clutch. If you've got a, a vehicle with a standard transmission, you know when you first start out at the stop sign, you're giving a little bit of gas and you're slowly letting the clutch out until you get the, the car rolling and uh, let the clutch all the way out. That's basically what's happening here is as the valves start closing, we're pushing that clutch pedal in and we're letting it slip a little bit of flow going back to it. Now, keep in mind, it is a bit of a parasitic device. I mean, really what we're doing is we're shedding away excess head energy since we can't change the output of this fixed speed circulator. So it's important, I would say, whenever you have more than four zone valves to consider a valve like this, even with a flat curve pump, uh, you can get into a, a condition where if this is a very small zone, maybe a half inch uh, baseboard loop here, and you still have a 12 gallon a minute pump that you're trying to shove through that half inch circuit, you're going to have some noise and you might have some uh, some complaints from the customer on that. So that valve we still offer in a couple different sizes. Nice about the Cluffy one, it's got very low pressure drop. Some of them out there on the market is just start looking at the CV spec on it. They've got a lot of pressure drop. You're burning up a lot of your your pump head just going through the valve. So that's what this valve is doing essentially in this drawing down here is we're just flattening that curve out, trying to make that curve of that pump that was up here and turn into a flat curve pump so that the head that we're adding to that circuit as the flow rate changes as the valves close stays fairly flat, fairly consistent. So that's another way around a job that's got a fixed speed pump that you have zone valves on is just put a bypass valve on it. And one other thing I wanted to say about this picture is 
this valve could really be installed back here. And in some cases, that may be desirable because if this was a long header in the mechanical room or maybe it went around the, the loop of the mechanical room or something, as this pump is running and these zone valves shut off, you've got all that heat loss going through all this piping. So if you had the valve back here and just this valve is open, you just have flow through this much of the circuit. You don't, you're not flowing through this entire uh, header pipe at supply and return coming back because you're just, uh, your valve is bypassing right down here. So the valve doesn't have to be at the end here necessarily. I mean, if it's a short run of a couple of feet like that in the mechanic room, uh, no harm there, but just know that it can be installed right uh, by the pump also. And here's a classic example of a job that um, has the bypass valve in it there, and there's the pump and multiple zone valves. A couple different ways you can set up this valve. I know some of the valves out there, there's numbers on them, and there's a table in there, and if you say what size pump, look up what size pump you have, it might tell you the number to set it on. Um, the threshold pressure, the cracking pressure is what you want to adjust on that. So when all the zone valves are open and it's flowing, you could actually put your hand here and you shouldn't feel any of the temperature. Let's say this is running at 180 degrees. You won't feel any warmth, any temperature here because the valve is completely closed down. If you don't have the chart or you don't know what to set it, just start shutting off valves. And as soon as the first valve shuts off, you should feel a little bit of flow start coming through this pipe here. That's how you know that you're at that threshold where it's going to crack open as soon as the valves start shutting off. And of course, when you get down to the all the valves but one open, you'll feel you know 90% of the flow is going <coughs> through the bypass valve and back to the uh, the pump. Anything you got there, Cody, so I can get a drink? <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say you need you need to take a breath there too, Bob. Um, the uh, on on those differential pressure bypass valves, you know, they're they're they were more popular in, in uh, you know in in history than they are currently, just because of uh, variable speed circulators. But one thing to be really careful of with those differential pressure bypass, like like ours is adjustable and it's adjustable from two to ten psi, and and you got to be really careful. We we get a lot of calls about kind of strange applications, whether it be breweries or whatever the case may be, and they, and they want to use this for, you know, chilled water or, you know, whatever the case may be, and they're using a high head circulator. If you have a circulator that produces more than the maximum limit, that threshold of the, our 519 series, then there's a chance that you've got, you're going to be always bypassing. You're, yep. you're not, it's never going to shut off completely. And so you got to be really careful with that. You know, like our, our differential pressure bypass is kind of more designed around, you know, residential applications. Um, but, uh, but just something to be aware of when you're, when you're picking one out, it's not necessarily just the pipe size. It's going to be what your, what your flow rate needs to be. And, and you got to consider your pump as well. And that goes back, Cody, to the very first slide that I put up there with, you know, doing the simulation. If you knew what these zones required and you knew what pump you're going to select, it's going to tell you what that delta P is going to be in here. And then you'll know that the valve's, you know, selected properly. It, it all, you know, it's all about the numbers. One other thing I'll add that you uh, kind of jogged my memory. I've had guys say, you know, we put these in and then we go to purge out these zones and we're having a hard time getting a good purge through there. It's a good <laughs> idea to put a ball valve in here because if you're going to put your uh, a fast fill or some guys fill with a garden hose to purge their system, you're going to flow right through there and not get a good flow going through them. So some guys will put a ball valve right here, here, anywhere there, that you can actually shut that off 100% from the circuit. So if you're going to do a, a you know, high pressure, a fast a purge with like a purge cart, for example, if you're pumping glycol into the system with a purge cart, you could be blowing that valve open. It's going to make it hard to purge, uh, purge those zones possibly. All right, so the, the next thing we'll talk about is there's that delta symbol again that we talked about. There's delta P circulators available on the market. In fact, there's quite a selection of them. And basically, what the circulator has the ability to do is change its output. It senses what's going on in the system as zone valves start closing off. In this example, is showing some of the thermal electric uh, zone valves on that header there. As those valves start closing off, the pump senses that differential and it slows down, basically. So again, it's trying to keep this curve very flat. Now again, we can't get quite to this dotted line, but you can see what happens here with the little dots as the valves start closing off. So again, we started out with a you know a peak demand of maybe 11 gallons per minute when all the zones are open. And as the zone valves close, you can see that we're not running up this pump curve. We're keeping that pretty flat. And we're doing it instead of slipping the clutch at the uh, pressure bypass valve. We're just telling the circulator, well, slow down. I don't have as much work to do. Um, ramp it down. And that's um, handled internally with this pump has the uh, that logic built right into the uh, processor on these delta p pumps that know when this condition is happening when these valves start shutting off and they just ramp this curve down and they just automatically adjust to the system there's a couple different settings on those uh, constant pressure there's an auto adapt feature again we, we did a pumping uh, 
webinar that tells you a little bit more about the different type of settings and one uh, one you would use at different settings or just uh, use the auto adapt and it'll actually over the course of a couple days it'll actually learn this condition here what happens as these valves are closing off and that pump will automatically adjust to exactly what you need think of it as a cruise control on your vehicle you know if you're going down the highway and you want to just maintain 60 mile an hour all the way down the street you just put that cruise in and it just adjusts the um, uh, the accelerator, the amount of fuel going to the engine, and it uh, makes your speed exactly right. That's really what we've done here is we put a cruise control on our circulator pumps. Yeah, Here's Bob. The, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was I was just going to mention too. We we got a question too from uh, uh, Frank, one of the pre-submitted questions. He was curious about the proper pressure settings for for ECM variable speed circulators when zone valves are used. Um, you know, I, I think you could probably add to this, but you, you know, it kind of goes back to the planning that you talked about before and figuring out what your, your head loss is through all these parallel circuits. And, and then obviously you're going to need to set your circulator to, you know, to that pressure setting for whatever maximum head loss is going to be based on what your flow requirements are. So. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> Yeah, that I've got the pre-submitted questions here. I think we tried to roll as many as we could into the presentation, but uh, certainly if we don't get to them in the presentation, we'll we'll email you back with the, what we think is a good answer. Um, what else on that picture? I think that was it. So this uh, actually just came to us this week from a uh, one of our reps that uh, did a design on a system. I think it's a big snow melt system. And notice what he's done here is he's used our um, 644 valves. These are our motorized zone valves with the high shutoff pressure. And he's I didn't talk to him about this job, so forgive me, I don't have all the details on it. But he's running this pump apparently in a fixed speed position, and it's a fairly high head pump. And so he's got about a 45-pound uh, delta P that he's trying to shut off again. So that obviously exceeds our Z1 zone valve. So that's why he chose to use this valve. Number one, he gets that higher shutoff pressure, but also he's got a full flow valve there. He's got that um, you know that high CV valve. So if these are going out to again the snow melt zones or something like that where he needs a lot of flow. He's got a nice uh, full port valve as well as he's got that high shutoff pressure also. Tell us too a little bit about this, Cody. When you get one of these and take it out of the box, you'll notice what five wires are coming out of the end of that. Uh, explain to the, our guests the reason for the all the wires and what to do with them. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's actually about six because there's actually a ground wire in there too. But but that that six four four two series or six four four three series uh, actuator is going to be a power open and power closed valve, um, which or actuator, which you know a lot of guys are used to the power power open spring return, you know, or or power whatever direction spring return, and and so that's where you gotta you know you really gotta think about your controls when you when you use a valve like this because you you do need power to open it and power to close it. We also still include an end switch on it, like we have available on our Z1s. Um, but, uh, but like I said, the, the wiring is just a little bit different. But even with standard components, you can make these zone valves work with a, a single pull double throw relay, where you're constantly powering one pull of the relay or, or you know, the actuator. And then as the relay switches, it'll power the other side of things. Um, that was these a, are also. Uh, go ahead. That was one of Cody's creations there that we had that call come in and Cody said, well, let's just get a little rib relay or something like that. That's a double throw relay. And so I think <laughs> you put a, a little graphic together, a little uh, schematic of yep. how to wire that so that if you do put one of these valves and say, wait a second, I can't get the valve to close. Uh, Cody came up with a fix and do a, a little schematic of how you can put a rib relay into our um, a relay box and, and have that ability for that valve to get power to open and also power to close with a standard thermostat without having to go to like a three wire thermostat that powers both ways. Yeah, you're going to have a hard time finding, you know, over the counter type stuff like that. But, you know, a standard single pull, uh, double throw relay, like a rib or whatever, it's going to be real easily accessible and, uh, and easy to service in the long run as well. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing that. Yeah. Now, also, we do have a, a couple choices for three-port zone valves. Now, here's a valve. Notice on this valve, there's three different markings on that. You've got an A port, a B port, and the AB, which is a common port. Now, we sell this valve for uh, a number of different things, but we actually sell this in a kit for our solar pumping stations. And so, basically, the flow comes in here and would go to the, uh, let's say, the indirect tank first, the solar tank, heat up that load. Once that tank gets up to temperature, the valve moves over to this position, and this can go to another load, either another tank or a dump zone or uh, maybe to a radiant zone out in your garage floor or something like that. So this valve can be used to you know, change direction, basically. It's just a, um, 
a three-port valve. And here's some of the more common applications for it, like in a big heating system in a commercial building, when there's no load or no call for heat, let's call this a fan coil unit, that valve would just allow the flow to just divert back to the system. So if you do have a large pump that you can't keep shutting off zone valve against without running up the curve, that's the application for this three-way valve. And this is common on a lot of uh, a little fan coil or air handlers that get chipped out with a three-port valve like this so they can uh, have that bypass circuit um, around it. <clears throat> and then with the, um, uh, right here in this little parentheses up here with the power off passage A is closed. Now I know there's something else, Cody, you wanted to talk to a little bit about that because uh, this valve could be sent out with a normally closed or could be installed, I should say, with a normally closed or a normally open actuator on it and that would just change the position of the flap, uh, flap with the power off, right? Yeah, for sure. So like you notice in the graphic there that, that port A is the normally closed um, and port B is the normally open. And, and then when you power uh, the normally closed actuator, it'll reverse that to where A will be open and B will be closed. Um, we get quite a few calls, um, not quite a few, but every now and then where, where a guy will have one of these things and it's piped backwards. And, and so when they you know, when it's not powered, it's going to the wrong direction. And, uh, and we do offer, you know, like we mentioned before, our normally open actuators. Um, so most of these guys are being shipped with normally closed actuators and say they get piped wrong. You can, you can switch them around. I, I really would recommend just repiping it for the long haul because, you know, in a lot of cases with most residential wholesale houses and whatnot, they're not going to stock normally open actuators because they're just not terribly common in the residential industry. Um, commercial is a different story, but, but, uh, but yeah, it, so if, if it does get piped backwards, um, you know, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to sweat it too much. You can, you can put on a normally open actuator on there and it, and it will function, um, but you just got to be careful on you know which side gets piped where and when you say repipe it i mean really all you do is take it out and flip it over i mean that's the pipe Correct. change on is just take it and rotate it 180 <laughs> degrees then you just move this port i mean you don't have to go in and cut all the piping out of the building and and start over just take the valve and rotate it 180 degrees and sweat it back in or if you have with our tail pieces just unthread it now i don't know do we make it through with it i said that yes maybe. yes we do we make a three-way with the one inch sheet thread so i mean that would be I mean, that, that would obviously the most ideal situation. You can just open the unions and flip it over and, and, you know, tighten the unions back up and hopefully not take too much of a bath. So, yep. Yep. So again, call us if you have applications, you know, questions or problems with something like that. Now, also we offer, um, since we're not in the pump business, um, we prefer zone valves on systems, but we do offer relay boxes that can power pumps. And see over here, our switching relays are for powering pumps, 110, uh, 120 volt output or for zone valves, and you can mix and match them. So um, again, we did a webinar or two or three maybe on the relay boxes over the years since we've had them out applications, and we've got, uh, was it number 14, hydronics issues on uh, controlling um, systems, whether you have pumps or valves or a combination of. So we'll show you some pictures here. I should probably speed it up. We always show up with 100 pounds of potatoes in a 50 pound bag for these webinars. So. Um, so quickly through this, all the features and benefits of relay boxes, it really simplifies it for the installer so you don't get wires crossed, so you make sure you've got enough power for every pump, you've got fuse protection, uh, you can uh, choose the different status of how the pumps uh, group together, turn on together. Um, you can mix and match pump and zone valve boxes if you've got some valves and some pumps. Uh, easy to troubleshoot, there's lights on there that are going to tell you when you've got a call for heat, when the, the zone valve or the actuator is uh, powered up and stuff like that. And they are compatible with uh, the different types of thermostats out there. Some of them are energy stealing and they need a common wire. We do have on our box, and how well you can see this, but you can see we've got a three connections for the thermostat. So you've got a common wire, uh, which one, I guess that one right there. So there's your red, your white, your common. So if you need power out to the thermostat to keep it powered up, uh, as long as you've got wires going out to it, uh, we're giving you that. Um, connection right at the board so you don't have to go in and get into your transformer with a wire nut somehow to get your, your thermostats powered up. So I think we came up with a lot of really unique features and thanks to the people out there asking us, and here's a classic example when it was installed, I mean a lot of the features that you see in this box are because you told us that's what you wanted or needed out there. So the status, the priority, uh, having the color-coded um, connections up here so you get your different thermostats on the right ones, uh, nice screws on there instead of push tabs so you can get your wire in there and make sure you've got a good connection on the top and bottom. 
multiple grounds so you don't have to put a wire nut in there and twist all your green wires together. So um, if you haven't tried one of the cluffy box, I think you're gonna you're really gonna be impressed with what we did inside there. Yeah, I was gonna say, Bob. I mean, this picture might look like there's a lot of wires in there, but uh, I, I know from personal right. experience trying to trying to cram that many wires into another brand of box can be a little difficult. Um, and I, I also wanted to mention too, uh, to all of our listeners here today that uh, we just started in on our Instagram account. So if, if you're, if you're, you know, you want to keep up with all of our products or see how other people are using our products, make sure to, to follow us on Instagram. Um, this one actually came from Triple H Hydronics as it's listed there in the bottom. Uh, they do some, some really nice nice work um, that I think everybody can learn from and including myself. I mean, they're, they, they just do some really incredible things with their with our products and a lot of other manufacturers' products as well. Yeah, thanks for that, and thanks to Triple H if they're tuned in today for sending us all these uh, these great job photos. You know, just generally about centrifugal pumps, we talked a little bit about the choices out there. I mean, pretty much every major pump manufacturer, even smaller pump manufacturers, now have an offering of. Uh, both the standard uh, three-speed or four-speed pumps, as well as the um, Delta P pumps, a couple Delta T pumps that are out there on the market. So um, really, you should be able to find a pump for most any application you can come across out there. And certainly, uh, you know, calling your reps or your wholesalers to help with the selection there. But um, a couple things I would uh, always encourage you to do when you do put a pump in is put isolation valves on both sides of it. Someday, somebody's going to have to work on that pump or change it out or something like that. And just having a couple what twenty dollars worth of valves can make it so much easier for the for the next guy to to get in there and work on it. So the other thing I want to show you here is that let's say you've got a job and you're not sure that that circulator was sized right. If uh, maybe the person before you or whoever installed that didn't pay attention to the sizing, you say, well, how do I know what the circulator is doing? How do I know if it's the right one or not? Well, uh, and we go over this uh, example of this in Hydronic 16. But if you have a way that you can put a pressure gauge on both sides of the pump when it's running, you'll measure. We can see in the little needles here the pressure differential that that pump is establishing when it's running. And with that number, and I'll show you in the formula here next you can figure out how, which, uh, how much flow this pump is uh, moving through the system, how many gallons per minute. Now, a couple ways you can do this. You can take and put a gauge on both sides like we showed you here. One thing I'd caution you about that is make sure they're accurate gauges, number one, and they're both three and zero when you put them in there so you get an accurate number because sometimes you're only looking at maybe three or four or five pounds differentials. So don't put a 80 or 100 pound gauge in here. Expect to see a one or two a pound difference here. So, uh, you know, get a gauge size close to what that pump is that's developing for pressure and uh, make sure that they're good gauges. Uh, I've seen people do it this way, a single gauge. So, you know, you've got the same reading because you've got the same gauge and just ball one off, ball one on, and then uh, read both sides of it. Or this example here. And I actually just went on on my bench this week and knocked up a couple where it's coming down here, a couple examples of that. So with that number, here's a little example. So let's say we uh, put um, gauges on both sides of the pump and we saw that we had a pressure differential, uh, 20 pounds on the outlet side, 15 on the inside. So we've got a DP pressure differential, 5.5 pounds. You can put that into the formula here and you'll get, um, so you need to know the temperature of the water makes a little bit of an effect on that. So if you can nail that right down to the temperature, get that number real accurate, put it in there and you'll see in this case here, we've got 12.9 feet ahead being developed. So you go to the pump curve for that brand of pump and that model pump, go up there at 12.9, run out to the curve right there, and then go straight down. And that's the flow rate that that pump is uh, moving at that condition right there. So we've got what, just under uh, six gallons per minute going through that, uh, through that system uh, based on the pressure readings that we took. So uh, there's meters that are made, differential pressure meters that you can buy that will do that for you that have the, um, a single meter that can read both sides, or again, you can just get a good um, accurate gauge and do it yourself. Again, on pumps, I talked a little bit about the choices. Here, here's an example. You can see there's steep curve pumps there that you might use for high uh, flow resistance um, jobs, maybe thermostatic radiator valves or something like that. Might be better with a high head circulator like that, and some of them that have fairly flat curves in here, but um, there's pretty much a, uh, a pump for everything. The other thing too is exercising pumps occasionally, and we have the ability with the relay box system from Calapi have an exercise function in there that will run that pump. I think it's what every 72 hours, if there isn't a call for heat, it'll it'll pop it on for what 15 or 30 seconds, Cody. 
Yep, that is correct. Yeah, and and both of our our boards, whether it be a pump board or a valve board, will do it. Um, and you know, obviously, if if uh, if your valve board everything's shut off for the summertime, you know, you're going to turn on that pump, and it will. I mean, theoretically, it will deadhead. Uh, but for the short period of time that it's actually running, it won't cause any problems at all. But it'll keep that pump from from you know season up over a long period of time. Yeah, and I'm, I think I got a couple more pictures. I'll show you one other thing we talked about this morning that can happen with a circulator pump that can airlock it too. But we talked about valves again, wide range of the sizes, voltages, CV. We talked about that. Fairly easy to find. Uh, ours are, you know, you can read the heads on the Z1 valves. You have to replace it. That's typically the um, the fail point on the valve was uh, the motor operator, not the valve body itself. Other than that one that was lined up that I showed you earlier. Uh, end switches on them. Uh, easy to repair. Three way versions. I think we probably hit on all that. Now, one other valve that we offer a selection of is a thermostatic radiator valve, and I'm this is a very underutilized valve in the U.S. market. I just love this little valve, especially since I put a handful of them in my own house here over the past couple of years. Basically, it's a non-electric valve, so there's a little thermostatic cartridge in here, and it senses the temperature as the airflow moves through these little um, louvers. At, at column on the side of it here, senses the temperature, and then it opens and closes that valve. And not only does it open and close it to turn it on and off, but it modulates it. So if you have a three position here, let's say that's maybe 68 degrees is where that valve is set, it'll just modulate that um, disc in there so that you're just getting the exact temperature that that valve is set at. Now you don't have to wire it back to a thermostat, to a relay box, or anything like that. It can be put right out on the, uh, the heat emitter, on the panel radiator, on a cast iron radiator, different jobs. We do have some with remote sensors. If you wanted to sense maybe a baseboard down the road a little bit, you've got a little bit of a tube on here that can move the sensor uh, remotely. We also have this one here that you could mount this uh, within a certain distance of the valve uh, itself, and then this could be a wall-mounted thermostat. So you could still have a thermostatic valve and have control on the wall instead of having to bend over to on the bottom of a, uh, a radiator or something like that. We've got the remote sensors available for that. And here's a couple of my jobs I'll show off that I've used some of our thermostatic radiator valves on. So I've just got a single little alpha pump on my buffer tank, uh, just sending water out all the time. And the only time that pump wakes up is one of these valves in the bedroom here call for heat. So there's your typical panel radiator. Um, this is a little cast iron pantry radiator. I've got one up there. And this is a little radiator that I made for a Christmas present a couple of years ago. And it also has a thermostatic head. Now, one thing I will say about this, we prefer to see the, the valves mounted on their side like this so you can get good airflow through those little uh, openings in the valve so you get a good temperature sensing. But, you know, between you and I, it works just fine in this position. It's just the preferred position would be have that to the side, but that's the trailer hitch on the bus there. So I had to have it vertically like that, Cody. <laughs> I won't say anything, Bob. <laughs> 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 now, I'm not exactly sure what's going on here, but probably a little bit of over-engineering on here. Rarely should you need to have this where you would have to have a pump and a zone valve right against it like that. Uh, most of the new pumps now have check valves that are built into them or that you can slip right into the volute here. So if that pump isn't running and a pump next to it, for example, is you shouldn't be getting any ghost flow going through that. But um, that's kind of a, a, a clever, <laughs> clever application. I'm not sure what the application is that you would have a you know, the transform of the zone valve and the pump, they're all in one package, but uh, just another nice picture from one of our, our contractors up in Nova Scotia. Thanks for uh, Stuart for sending that in. I like the way that he's wired this up here. Um, you know, the wire, the high voltage wire going through the back of the board and then going right to the, uh, the zone valves. Nice about this is a lot of the zone valves come with the 18 inch leads on them. And I think in fact, those are our leads that come with it. So by putting the relays right at the valves like that, the leads that come on it um, will reach right down to the connections possibly. And what I would say up here too, now keep in mind, we just showed you earlier that we've got PEX connections. He could have come right off the sweat version valve here, put a PEX connection on the top and gone right into his PEX to his, now I see he's got a little dull isolation valve there, but we do have the ability now to go copper to PEX and just uh, make it a real simple, quick installation for you. <clears throat> this is another one of uh, uh, Cody's clever schematics that he put together when people call and say, well, what if I want to put a, a, a low temperature zone out with some high temperature zone? So I'm going to let Cody talk to this a little bit about um, <coughs> what he was thinking here. Well, I, I was going to say, Bob, the, the golden rule with multiple temperatures is uh, anytime you add a mixing valve, you, know, you need to add another circulator. Uh, we, we get uh, too many calls, in my opinion, about guys that are, they, they 
install a thermostatic mixing valve and they, they want to add a radiant zone that's maybe running 120 or 130 versus their cast iron radiators or copper fin tube and uh, they're trying to use a single pump you know to, to operate both of these devices or both of these temperatures and uh, and mixing valves you, you can't pump into the hot inlet I mean among other things if you know the if say the mixing valve starts to close down the hot inlet port you're gonna also reduce flow through the rest of your zone you're gonna deadhead your circulator and everything else uh, by pulling through the mixing valve you're gonna create an equal pressure at both the hot and cold inlets so that way the mixing valve can operate appropriately um, so again multiple temperatures if you're adding a mixing valve it doesn't matter if it's a thermostatic mixing valve or electronic mixing valve. You need to add a circulator. It's going yep. to be the most I important think thing. I think he did a, uh, an article years ago called A Little Floor Warming, Please, and he kind of tried to drill that into us that you can't just put in. You would say, well, what if I put the mixing valve right here? It's on the discharge side of the pump. Won't it just go up like it? No, it won't. And the other thing to be aware of here, too, is watch the CV on these valves. You know, that uh, little mixing valve, it had a three CV valve, and you have a demand out here for 10, 15 gallons per minute. You don't have enough valve to be able to supply that kind of uh, uh, flow going through. So, you know, make sure when you're sizing these two devices that you've got enough uh, capacity in the valve to do the flow rate that you need. Uh, I would probably call you talk to this. I think Watts Up with Watts was a clever title for your, your <laughs> lead into this. Uh -huh. Pun, pun intended. So, I mean, we, we wanted to talk about the, the costs of versus, you know, zone valves versus circulators. And obviously, you know, you got to think of your upfront costs. Um, you know, it, when you're looking at pumps, you're looking at isolation, you're looking at PT ports, you're looking at the high voltage stuff. Um, whereas, you know, the, the zone valve, I mean, in most jurisdictions uh, of, you know, the people that I talk to, um, as far as uh, contractors, they're they're allowed to do all their low voltage, whereas usually an electrician has to do high voltage. I, I know that there are some areas of the country, in Canada too, for that matter, where, where an electrician is required for anything, including low voltage. Uh, so you got to take that into account. But but then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, every everybody's thinking about today and right now and, and maybe tomorrow if we're lucky, you know, and, and they, they want to try and get away with it as, as inexpensively as possible and, and so on and so forth. But but you got to think about long term costs, you know, it, after you leave that job, that customer is going to be the one paying the energy bill, you know, and, and you could. I mean, this holds true with anything. I mean, you you put it in and it works right. But, you know, if you if you could have designed it maybe where there was a little bit more upfront cost, but there's going to be less cost down the road. Uh, if you were to present that to any homeowner, of course, they're going to, you know, they're going to fall over backwards and thank you, you know. And so you, you got to think about long-term costs as far as how many watts and, you know, how, you know, how much electricity it's going to be using. You got to think about repairs or replacements, you know, as far as replacing circulator pumps as they fail or replacing actuators as they fail. Um, you know, there's all things that take into account, you know, as far as, as far as choosing whether you're doing mixing valve or excuse me zone valves or or circulators and uh, a lot of good points there. Yeah, and and we're so, not going to give you a definitive answer at the end of this today on which one you should use. Um, here's another thing too that we do for you is all of our um, relay boxes come with these little uh, wiring schematics, but we also show the piping schematic that matches up with it. And I think uh, we did what maybe four or five of these Nidronic 16 where we showed you, okay, if you're gonna pipe it this way, this is how it needs to be wired. So that's a good thing to look at. Um, you know, I don't know of anybody else that has both the piping, the wiring, and we have an essay that explains what's going on. Okay, when the thermostat calls for heat, the relay's gonna come in, it's gonna open the zone valve, and it's gonna turn the pump on. You got a, the ability to put your secondary pump and your boiler pump on here. So we tell you, you know, in a uh, paragraph or two, what's going on, what to expect here. Then we show you how to wire it and also um, how the piping would match up with it. So uh, we've got these for pumps as well as zone valves. This one just shows a zone valve example of that. I was going to say too, Bob, on all of our on all of our zone valve controls, um, when you open the cover on it, on the inside of that outer cover, there's going to be a QR code, and that QR code will take you directly to our comprehensive wiring guide. And you might be thinking to yourself, why on earth don't we include this wiring guide in with all of the zone valve controls? And it's because it's a roughly 50 page document uh, with with color diagrams and the whole nine yards just like what you see on this slide um, so if, if you're if you're doing something kind of above and beyond you know kind of a standard really simple zoning system with pumps or valves you know make sure to look at that QR code and, and scan it look it up in your, your tablet or your, your smartphone and uh, and like Bob said you know we've got wiring diagrams that couple with you know kind of a conceptual drawing of, of your piping 
and and then it goes over a kind of sequence of operation and how things are you know designed to work and so we we try to make it as easy as possible to use use our our controls to to you know make your system go the way it's supposed to and Cody and Greg make it even easier. You can call them and talk to them about it if you have a question. Or problem. So, <laughs> yes, and, and Kevin also. Very true. Kevin's tuned in today. He also helps with the product support up there in the product development up in Milwaukee. <laughs> so again, you know, what's the, how do I decide which to use? You know, there is no right or wrong. Typically, uh, some guys will look at the load size. They said, you know, if it's under 150,000 BTU, I can easily move 12 gallons a minute with a single, you know, simple uh, off-the-shelf little wet rotor circulator, that's the, well, how I decide if I got a 200,000 B2 boiler, I'm probably going to need more than one pump or I'm going to be getting into a big, uh, high, uh, higher price pump. So you can look at it that way. Some people say, well, I've had more luck or reliability issues with one or the other. That's another thing. And really, at the end of the day, it comes down to personal favorites. And you'd be surprised when I'm doing seminars how many times people say, well, my dad always used X brand and this type of valve, and that's what we use. And same thing at the wholesale. So why would we change? We've always used this brand of valve or this type of application. You know, it's just uh, old habits sometimes die hard. But um you know, this is a classic example. So much available to you now to make a system really exactly what you want as far as the pumping flow rates, the way you want to control it. And this is a great one from uh, Ezzy. Uh, some of you guys that hang out on heating help probably know Ezzy from the heating help. And this is one of his jobs back uh, back in New Jersey, I guess. And you can see what he's got going on here. So he's got one pump that's just going out to a single um single zone, maybe an air handler, something like that. So he's got a single zone really uh, for that pump right there. And these other ones are being controlled via zone valve. So the zone valve uh, opens up, it calls on through the relay box, calls on the appropriate pump. You can see he's got Delta P pumps on these ones that have multiple zone valves. So the zone valves open and close. These three pumps here are gonna ramp up and down. Um, he's got air separation where it should be, low water cutoff. I mean, this is probably the you know textbook example of how a system uh, could or should be piped as far as access to everything. Notice too that he's labeled everything nicely. So it tells you where that goes. And over here, it tells you which one matches up with that. So someday somebody's gonna have to troubleshoot this job so they can say, oh, that goes up. No heat in the upper master bedroom. There's the valve, there's a control for it. it makes it simple to troubleshoot it. So um, I don't know what else I could say on that other than thanks uh, for sending it in and uh, raising the bar on the, the quality of the jobs out there. Anything else on that, Cody? Or? No, no, I was going to say I, I used to speak with Ezzy on a fairly regular basis. I haven't heard from him in a while, but uh, but yeah, I, we found this on Heating Help, and, and it's a, just a perfect example. I mean, one thing that we didn't mention before, we've got all of our zone pump controls and zone valve controls. Um, up at the very top there, we do have a, a single zone control. Um, that, that one's operating that single pump, that, uh, that non-variable speed circulator there, the second one from the top. Um, to kind of round out our lineup of of controls. Uh, so, but yeah, beautiful, beautiful work. I I would be happy to work on this. So. A job like this puts Max through college. It's got everything cluffy on there. The fill valve, the third <laughs> separator, air separator, buffer tank over here. Uh, yeah, one question, maybe a few. Um, if given a choice when you're zoning with zone pumps, if you have a choice of installing the circulator in horizontal pipe orientation or vertical pipe orientation? Is there a preference one way or, or the other? Yeah, and that was the one I know we talked about, and that's a good question because here's what I've heard is happening out there, and I haven't witnessed myself. Notice how easy on this one here that he's put his pumps in mounted on a horizontal pipe like that. What can happen if you put a pump like this that has an integral check valve in it on a vertical riser like that, and over the summer when that pumps off, if there's any little air that came out of the system, what can happen? That air can come up, migrate its way up to a pump that might be mounted here, for example, and actually airlock that pump because the check valve in there will prevent that air bubble from working its way up to, I don't know, a radiator, an air handler, whatever might be up higher than this, that the air is going to migrate up to that high point, given the path to do that. But by putting this pump vertically in there with a check valve in it, we've heard heard cases where they go to start up in the fall. In fact, we had that happen in our building, Milwaukee, and the pump was airlocked, and that's all you had to do is, you know, crack open the flanger a little bit and burp that air bubble out of it, and it took off. So somehow, somewhere, an air bubble made its way into that pump. Uh, in this position, you kind of, uh, uh, you know, eliminate the possibility for that uh, Unless you get the whole system airlocked, of course. But yeah, that was a good, that was a good point. I don't know what the pump people's opinion on that is. I mean, I didn't have that issue come up until we started putting those check valves right in the pump. Now, if the check valve was six or eight inches away, you know, in a separate uh, remote uh, or you know 
an external mounted check valve, you know, you'd have that piping distance that could handle that little air bubble and it wouldn't uh, lock up in the volute of the pump. One other one that I want to throw in there, because this is one of my favorite from the, the, the uh, questions that were sent in, is somebody asked, does the circuit layout affect the pressure drop of a given length of radiant PEX, uh, an example like 90 degree bends or 180 degree bends in a radiant tube? And, you know, that's an interesting question because a couple of years ago I bought a, a tubing bender to bend copper tube, a curvo, and I went to the copper t uh, development agency, and they said if the radius of a half inch or three quarter copper pipe is eight inches or more, you don't consider that an elbow when you do your calculations for pressure drop. You know, when you're doing your pressure drop, you add up all your elbows, your T's, your fittings and uh, valves and stuff like that, and you put it in, and typically a, a, what an elbow might be worth five feet or something, a straight piping. But if you put like a sweep, like a, even a 12 inch bend in a you know, pex loop or something like that, you don't have to count that as two elbows or a 180 degree bend. So it really depends on how short of a, uh, a turn you're making. But I've never heard of people counting up all the loop ends on their on their radiant jobs and, and adding those up as pressure drop in the circuit. And it's it's about the uh, the sweep of the bend. All right, Mark. Uh, Bob, um, we have a number of pump manufacturers on the webinar and several still on. One of them just confirmed what you just said about the orientation of the pump, horizontal versus vertical, by the way, and the checks. Yeah, and there's a class example one that is put <laughs> vertically, and uh, I don't know, and maybe there's not a check in it, because the checks now that come with the pumps, you can take them out. They used to come in the box separately, and then you could either put it in or leave it out. Most of them that I've gotten recently, the checks are in there, but you can just reach in there with a needle nostrils plier or something, pull them out, and if you don't need or want the check, like the guy that put the zone valve after the pump, obviously he didn't need the check valve, so um, yeah, so anyways, that's, I think that clears that up a little bit. Thanks to the pump people for chiming in there. So in this photograph, the tank on the right-hand side uh, is a thermocon. Basically, it's the heating um, buffer tank uh, to prevent, uh, it's like a flywheel, right? The question is, um, if, and you can't see the boiler in this photograph, but if you have a indirect tank for hot water, domestic hot water, and there's a call for hot water, how, what happens to the control? And what happens to the system? Uh, I can I can probably jump in on that one uh, for you, Bob. I mean, I when I was in the field, we used to do a lot of systems with buffer tanks just because we were doing a lot of small zones and we wanted to make sure that we could, you know, make sure that that boiler is not short cycling. And and what we did in a lot of those cases, we had a lot. We used a lot of the alpha circulators along with the the Kalefi zone valves as well. Um, we would let the everything on the system side of that buffer tank operate as normal pulling heat from that buffer tank while meanwhile the pump from the boiler to the buffer tank would shut down and then your pump from the boiler to the indirect tank would fire up so uh -huh. basically by shutting down that circulator between the, the boiler and the, the buffer tank you know you're not affecting it in any way and then the boiler can heat the, the indirect and do what it needs to do yep Yep, and that would be, a, um, I think we show some examples of that in a couple of our different hydronics where, you know, do I put the pump before the buffer tank and the hydro separator? In that case, if you did, you could have a pump dedicated to the indirect uh, heater and that it could just go right from the boiler to the indirect. And you could prioritize that too, right, Cody? If you wired it that way, sure. if you want everything to shut off while it's recovering that domestic water load, you could uh, prioritize that. And I realize make it easy for you to do that. We've got the uh, the one relay that actually says it right on, a priority pump that you can uh, lock everything else out until you recover that load. Yeah, I really wouldn't recommend putting the pump for the indirect on the other side of this buffer because in a lot of cases, I would assume a lot of these zones are going to be low temp zones for whether it be radiant or or uh, panel radiators or whatever. So that buffer tank is going to be, you know, 130, 140 degrees tops. And, and then all of a sudden you need your, your, your indirect to kick on. Well, obviously you don't want to heat that whole buffer tank up to 180 and, uh, you know, because then you're going to have, you know, too hot of water going out to your zones after that indirect priority is over. Yeah, and some of the boiler manufacturers actually will give you that control in the boiler that if you put a second pump on the boiler, that all the pumps shut off, the boiler pump shuts off, all the secondary pumps shut off, and then it just flows from the boiler directly to the indirect tank at that higher temperature, say 180 degrees, yep. and shuts off. So you'll have a little slug of hot water there, but it's got a dedicated, you know, the control in the boiler knows when there's a domestic hot water call, shuts off the main circulator to the buffer tank just to the load and come in. So again, there's different ways you can do that. It just depends again on your goals and what's expected, um, you know, what the customer's expecting. I think we have one more question and maybe give it a wrap. Um, okay. The question is, you've talked about 
thermostatic radiator valves acting as zone valves. If you are using thermostatic radiator valves for your heat emitters and you have a ECM variable speed pump, how do you control that ECM pump with such type emitters? Yeah. And you know, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. And probably one of the most clever that I heard is our friend Nathan White up in, uh, up in Alaska. He uses thermostatic radiator valves on panel radiator valves, and he's using a little Delta P pump. And what he found is Phoenix uh, Controls makes a little, oh, I call them induction relay. It's a little relay that you just wire into the pump. And this senses when that pump, even at a very low flow rate, that when that pump wakes up or comes on, on, and then it just makes an end switch. And Cody probably remembers these from the old April air humidifiers that we put in years ago. And you'd take that little induction relay, wrap the wires through it so that it would kick on the blower when the, when the humidifier uh, called on. And it's basically that type of relay. But the little one from Phoenix Controls, and it's, I think it's PHNEX is how it's spelled, is adjustable. And it'll go down to like a point one amp or something draw that it will wake up on so that's one way so that the thermostatic radiator valve opens the pump wakes up and says okay now who's going to make the boiler come on there is no interaction you know wiring interaction between that valve and the pump so as the pump starts to rev up that little induction really um uh, trips on the boiler now cody i think you had another um uh, like a central thermostat option too yeah, I mean, there's a lot of times too where, say, say you're running a boiler that's operating, a, you know, a set point controller that's connected or wired into the buffer tank. So the boiler, a lot of times, will maintain the buffer tank based on an outdoor reset curve. Uh, from there, on the other side of that buffer tank, you put in one of your your uh, variable speed circulators, your differential pressure based circulators, and and then from there you just operate the whole the boiler off of a central thermostat. And in a lot of cases, you just take that central thermostat, you put it about one or two degrees above whatever your actual set point is and, and that or whatever your desired temperature is throughout the house. And then from there, that operates the boiler to turn on the, you know, to heat the buffer tank. And yep. then the the variable speed circulator on the other side does, does its own thing. And I know, I mean, you mentioned Nathan White as far as that relay. I know uh, there's one of our reps out in the New England area as well as also using, uh, has done this before as well with, with good success. All right. Well, we'll see you next month, folks. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, guys.